listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to talk about the ethics of mind transfer technology. We'll be reading tonight from a scientific paper titled Theological and Eth Ethical Aspects of Mind Transfer in Transhumanism, written by one Mr. Gregor Osinski from the Higher School of Social and Media Culture in Turin, Poland. This is going to be an interesting read tonight. It has to do with one of the main tenets here of transhumanism, the concept that you can transfer your mind into a machine. It's an interesting thought process, and it is one of the ultimate goals of the transhumanists. They really believe that they could transfer their consciousness into a machine. That being the case, they make an argument for why this could be good. And it sounds nice, doesn't it, to be able to think that perhaps you can transfer your mind or your consciousness into some other receptacle and live forever. Maybe be able to take on any form that you want within some perhaps virtual reality world or even in the real world. Perhaps they can transfer your consciousness at some point into another body, a physical biological body or a robotic body or some such combination thereof, cyborg body. This is all very much science fiction sounding, but these people who are pushing this transhumanist notion of things very much are looking for this outcome, and they believe it's achievable. And it's achievable very soon, according to many of the futurists and experts who push this notion. People like Ray Kurzweil, who predicts singularity by the year 2049. And in fact, it may be even sooner than that, according to some. We see in just recent weeks here, the rise of artificial intelligence, how it's really taken off, and how it's been exploited in so many ways already. So with these things in mind, we have to remember, there's a goal for all of this stuff. And that goal is the transhumanist singularity which will lead us directly into what they call post-humanism. Existence past the point of humanity. The next evolutionary step in humanity, post-humanism, according to those people who push this philosophy that is transhumanism. That's their goal. They want to transcend this current state of being and become very much godlike able to control their environment in unheard of ways in the past and control everything, even the minds of others, of their fellow beings. That's what the goal is all about. And it's promised to the masses, but it's not intended for the masses. What the masses will get... Well, I'll just... Go ahead and quote a YouTube channel out there that is pro-transhumanism. They called transhumanism, quote, eugenics without coercion, end quote. So essentially, this whole notion of transhumanism is leading man to his ultimate destruction. That's what its whole goal and purpose is. Now, for the quote-unquote elites of this world, those controlling influences, these dark occultists that run things at the top of the power structure. That's not what their goal is for transhumanism, not for themselves, but for the masses at large. You see, it's a dual-use technology, and it's a double-edged sword. So they want to try to achieve various goals through this transhumanist notion of things. They want to be able to transcend their human biological form and their limitations and become very much more so godlike and really solidify their control in this place. And in so doing, in so doing, they seek 
to really benefit from all of the many wonderful things that many of our technologies can do. And they will promise that to the masses. And the masses will buy into it. But it's not intended for the masses. They're not going to be the beneficiary of the good uses of this technology. Only those within the 1% within the power structure will be the beneficiaries of the technology. And perhaps a couple of their well-meaning underlings of sorts, the order followers, maybe some of them will be able to transcend into the transhuman future, but uh, they will have a very limited role. And their will, their will will be cut short by those who control the very systems that they seek to put in place with this. Uh, so that being the case, the one of the chief tenets of all of this is this mind transfer idea that they will try to sell to the masses at some point here in the very near future. In fact, they're working on it now because, once again, Elon Musk came out and said that they will be testing Neuralink in human trials now, starting this year. Of course, he said that for the previous four years, and nothing's come of it yet, but still... The push is on for these BCI, these brain-computer interface technologies, in order to merge man with the machine. And in so doing, bringing about this transhumanist future. So they'll try to convince people that this could be the answer to all of humanity's ailments. When in fact what it is, is a gigantic eugenics program, a depopulation program... You see, the whole intention from these elites, these dark occultists at the top of the power structure that run things in this world, the big intention with it is to convince people that they can live forever by transferring their mind into a machine when in fact it's simply just a mass genocide that will occur at that point. Simply duplicating your behaviors in a computer is not, in essence, the ontological self. That's not you in the machine. That's not the ghost in the machine, as they would like you to believe. You won't be there. That's not you. Your spirit will not transfer in that way. Because spirit is one of the intangibles here within this world that they cannot work with in this way. So although to people looking in from outside at this consciousness that's transferred into the machine, it would very much look like you and act like you, and they might even believe that it is you, but is it really you in that machine? I would say no. That your spirit, your animus, that divine spark that makes all living things alive is not there. It's not present. It's something that's missing from the formula here of transhumanism, something intangible that they can't duplicate. But yet they will try to attempt to tell people that they can, and many people will buy into that notion because our modern cult of scientism will convince them that all there is is this physical world, this material world in which we live, and all these other aspects of things, anything you would deem spiritual or how you would define consciousness or this kind of thing, can be whittled down to little more than the electrochemical activity of the brain and brainstem. And so being, then it could be whittled down to little more than an algorithm that can be duplicated in a machine, and if it could be duplicated in a machine, then y you can transfer your consciousness in that way. This is the bill of goods they'll try to sell to the world. And many, unfortunately, will buy into that notion and think that this is their ticket to immortality. And this is their ticket to being able to be who or whatever they want. So they'll take advantage of the situation... And they'll give their tacit consent to be uploaded into the cloud. And all that will really happen, folks, is their destruction. 
And I don't know what the spiritual ramifications thereof would be for somebody that's tricked into this notion of things. But, but I would caution people to be weary of this. And with that said, we should probably get into the paper here. So we're going to read from this paper. Once again, it's titled Theological and Ethical Aspects of Mind Transfer and Transhumanism. So let us begin. Abstract. Mind transfer is the most important concept of transhumanists. Its technological implementation is to copy and transfer the human mind to a computer by exact mapping of all neural connections in the human brain and their precise copying in a computer simulation. The idea of mind transfer also brings some dangers related to the denial of human nature, the placing of hopes for future life in digital spaces, and the liberation from the limitations imposed on man by his biological structure. Transhumanists believe that in order to achieve mind transfer, various technologies defined by the acronym NBIC, which stands for nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science, currently available should be used. The very dynamic development of these technologies in recent years, and in particular the latest AI, or artificial intelligence algorithms, seem to be very fast approaching the moment when practical mind transfer will be possible. This paper contains a very brief description of these technical capabilities with the necessary short commentary on their ethical aspects. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So there we go. This guy has very well defined what it is the transhumanists are looking for and the use of these various technologies to try to do that. But he's also pointing out that there are dangers here. And he's also, I don't know if he mentions it, but we'll see when we get through there. This whole notion of being able to do exact mapping of all neural connections, well, does that necessarily equate to mind? Does it really? Does copying the structure of the brain in a computer, is that going to create a mind? And that's, that's a major part of the question. Does consciousness reside therein? Or is it just a cheap knockoff? Is it imitating what's already there? And what we know about AI right now is it cannot create anything new. It draws from what is already extant and out there to make whatever it is that it makes, to duplicate whatever it can duplicate. It has no creative spark to it. It's not creative. All it can do is draw from examples elsewhere, and it does have really fast computational speed, so it can do this rather quickly, but still, it's a, not doing anything new. It's not creating anything new. It's drawing off of all old existing data that's already out there. So that being said, do you really think it could really adequately transfer a person's consciousness into the machine or adequately duplicate a person's consciousness in some way? I don't think it can. Do you think it can accurately map somebody's exact neural pattern right down to each individual cell and, and interaction in their brain and brainstem? This mapping hasn't even been completely done yet. At least they don't admit to it openly in the public sector. I suspect within the auspices of uh, special access programs, perhaps they've done a bit more of this type of research already, and it could be maybe further advanced than we would suspect. But at this point, it's hard to say for sure. But let's get further into the paper, because now that we've read the abstract, we'll get to the introduction. Issues relating to the transhumanism are increasingly being seriously discussed in the scientific community. Transhumanism is not a monolithic ideology, but it does have an official declaration and an organization. The goal of the transhumanists is to cross the boundaries of human condition and create a post-human. 
Since we are currently in an intermediate situation between human and post-human, the current human condition is defined by the prefix trans, as transhuman. In order to achieve the goal of creating a post-human being, transhumanists use various technologies called by the acronym NBIC, which we just discussed prior. The use of such a variety of methods causes a lot of misunderstandings related to the difficulty of a synthetic approach to different scientific disciplines. Discussing only one field, for example, biotechnology, will not allow us to fully understand the problem. However, a broader approach is extremely difficult because it requires knowledge of many different fields of modern science and technology. In this work, very difficult tasks will be undertaken. Even a superficial reference to all the components of NBIC in order to describe the most important goal of transhumanists, which is mind uploading. Oxford University's Future of Humanity Institute, a major transhumanist group, released a report of the technological requirements for uploading a mind to a machine. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. And he has the quotation here, Sandberg, 2008. This group, this Oxford University Future of Humanity Institute, is indeed a major player in the transhumanist notion of things. And they have a lot more influence than you might think. I mean, think about that. Oxford University. This is one of the major social engineering portions in this world. One of the major places that promulgates social engineering. Oxford. So, we have this notion coming out of Oxford. So, the transhumanists have pretty much gotten themselves inculcated into the education sector. Very much so. Academia. There's a lot of them in academia. And many of them really push and promote these ideas, as we see here, and through places like Oxford. A lot of them get taken seriously and a lot of people begin developing technologies towards this goal. And we do see this convergence of these NBIC technologies happening today. And they're kind of clicking together very quickly at this point. So quickly, in fact, it seems like, well, maybe only mere weeks away before we begin to see some major changes and shakeups in this world because of these things. That's where we're at on the timeline of things here, folks. We're going to see rapid changes here very, very soon within this world. And there's a plethora of reasons for that. But this push for transhumanism is certainly one of the key components for those in positions of power in this world that would like to see this thing come to fruition. It's a false paradigm, though. And that's the way I see it. I don't think it's going to succeed. But they're pushing hardcore for this. And we'll see. I, I don't know what the future is going to look like or how it will all shape out. But time will tell. And I could just tell you what it is they have planned here, what their ideas are. And that's why we like to look at stuff like this. So let's go ahead and continue reading here. The current approach to this problem is best reflected in the words of transhumanist Susan Schneider. And she says, quote, Our brains evolved for specific environments and are greatly constrained by anatomy and evolution. But artificial intelligence has opened up a vast design space, offering new materials and models of operation, as well as novel ways to explore the space at a rate much faster than biological evolution. I call this exciting new enterprise mind design. Mind design is a form of intelligent design, but we humans, not God, are the designers, end quote. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So do you hear the sheer hubris? in many of the things that the transhumanists have in mind. So we humans, not God, are the designers. That's what she says. Let's continue on. So the latest technology that transhumanists have great hopes for is artificial intelligence technology. Subjective and not subjective treatment of man is a typical feature presented more and more often in the scientific circles. 
Seeing science as a direct continuation of the idea of enlightenment, many contemporary scientists have turned the fundamental eschatological question, how can I be saved, into the practical question, how can I be happy? Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. So we do see this in modern society and modern culture, don't we? This switching over of fundamental principles, things anchored in religion, spirituality, eschatology, all these ideas. How can I be saved? How do I know what happens beyond death? How do I know what's after this? What's the nature of existence? All of these existential questions have been replaced with something as simple as, how can I be happy? This is the hyper-materialist paradigm in action. How can I be happy? What can I do to gratiate myself here, now, in the physical? How can I be happy? So they've replaced important questions with questions of temporary gratification. How can I be happy? We see this going on in society. It is a fundamental shift very much brought about in the modern era here. And it's also a manifestation of what Rudolf Steiner called the spirit of Ahriman in this world. What I would rightly call the spirit of Antichrist. But let's continue reading here because this is a good point that's made there. And it is in this convention that they consider the problems that may arise during the development of AI technology. The declaration creators only wonder what to do to make AI serve man and do not notice that it has an increasing influence on man in every possible dimension. The widespread use of AI algorithms in Internet technologies is gradually getting users used to the universal capabilities. The use of AI technology in the collection of an, and analysis of big data sets of user data allows for global and effective marketing strategies. Using AI in personalizing content in information channels can be used to manipulate entire social groups. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Social media does this. Personalizing the content through AI. This is algorithms. We see this. This has been going on for some time now. They use algorithms to steer people into their own little private echo chambers through the use of this technology. And therefore, therefore, the message really doesn't get heard by people outside of the echo chamber, by and large. This is one of the things that's been done with social media in recent years, probably going back, oh, about 2017 is when they really hammered everything down with it, nailed it down tight, and made sure that their algorithms were flagging things that were not up to the official standard or the official narrative of things, and push people down to the bottom through shadow bans and various other methods here. It's the algorithms that determine this. Platforms like YouTube have become so censored and these algorithms have become so very constraining that it makes it almost impossible to get new listeners. Impossible. The message just doesn't get out there beyond the small circles that it does. And that's why word of mouth is still the most important way to let people know where to find valuable information like this. You need to tell people about it. Share Support these things that you want to see. You need to support the things that you want to see. Continue. Because if you don't, they're going to go away. I mean, YouTube has pretty much proved that. And people tolerate it. And many people don't even realize something's gone on because of the nature of the algorithms. Many people would say, oh, I, I thought that channel just disappeared. Uh, so it's it's really gotten out of hand, the, the whole censorship narrative here, with everything. But the thing is, we're not alone out there. 
There's a lot of people that think the same way as we do. There's a lot of people that find value in this information. It's just they're not aware that somebody's out there sending it out there over the airwaves because it's got censored. And they're not being exposed to the material. So that's why it's important that you share and use word of mouth and support these things so that they can continue going on. Uh, but I'll get off my little soapbox now and continue with the paper here. Because this is the important part, the information. Not so much who the, the messenger is or that kind of thing. It's the information itself. It transcends all of that. So let's go ahead and we'll continue here. Cardinal Robert Serra recognizes this, this situation very well and describes it in his book, The Day is Now Far Spent. The Cardinal clearly indicates that in the hearts of the Westerners, he sees rejection of creative fatherhood of God. Although most often he refers the issue to the gender ideology, immediately afterwards he defines transhumanism as the last symbol of the God rejection. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. This is another hugely important point here. You see, this whole gender ideology issue that's been thrust on society right now is also a symptom of this, of transhumanism. It's a symptom of transhumanism. It's a subtle push towards transhumanism. And it is a rejection of God. It is the last symbol of rejecting God, transhumanism. So this is where you make a choice. This is absolutely what the Bible predicted with the mark of the beast and that whole system. Christ or Antichrist. It is here where you make your choice. Are you going to step into the transhumanist future or are you going to reject that altogether and stand with God, stand with the spiritual? And that's the whole point here. That's what transhumanism is. It's an utter rejection of God. And we're getting to that tipping point now in this world where it's going to be time to choose a side. Choose where you're going to stand. Draw that line in the sand. And don't cross it. Or cross it. It's your prerogative. You can do either way. You could capitulate to the beast system. Or you could reject the beast system. It's not going to be an easy path. But these are choices we all have and we have to make on an individual level here. And it's all about this transhumanist notion. Transhumanism. Who would have ever thought? I, I mean, if you go back to like the, the 1960s and 70s when uh, they were putting out all these chick tracts and stuff like that from all the, the Bible-believing churches and all of these things, the little comic book things with the representations. Did you really think transhumanism had any kind of a notion back then? It hadn't. I mean, the whole term and ideology was introduced by, by Huxley. It was introduced by Julian Huxley in the 1950s, but it went to the wayside. Many people didn't understand at that point that it had to do with technology. They didn't have a true notion or understanding of it. It didn't really wasn't really popularized in that time. But who would have thought that this would play a key role in the eschatological developments that are happening now in this world? I've been a student of eschatology for quite some time. A long time. I studied eschatology, end times prophecy, all of these things. And it's astounding how transhumanism fills the bill for everything, everything predicted in the Bible about what you would call the eschaton, Armageddon, whatever terms you want to come up with for this, the end times, the end of the age, if you want to refer to it that way as well. It fits all the descriptions. Fits every single one of the descriptions of what you would call Antichrist. 
transhumanism. And here it is. And this is confirmed in writings like this and, of course, the work that this guy is quoting from, which is a book here written by written by a cardinal, Cardinal Sarah is his last name, just like it sounds, S-A-R-A-H. He wrote it in a book called The Day Is Now Far Spent, where transhumanism is the last symbol of the God rejection. Let's continue reading and see what else we can find here. He writes, The West rejects the gift, agrees only to what it will create itself. Transhumanism is the last symbol of this movement. For the Westerners, even human nature, precisely because it is a gift from God, becomes unbearable. End quote. And that's from that same Cardinal Sarah. He absolutely sees the writing on the wall with this, understands the spirit behind it, and make no doubt about it, transhumanism definitely has a spirit behind it. And it's not a godly spirit. Let's put it that way. Let's read on. The, the position expressed by Cardinal Sarah is unambiguous in its wording and indicates the main problem faced by the entire Latin civilization today. The problem of the increasing rap rapidly developing technology that supports the transhumanism ideology has to be widely considered, both by circles representing the paradigm of technoscience and by representatives of the humanities who have remained faithful to the fundamental principles on which the Latin civilization has developed so far. That is why extremely important seems the initiative of the Scientia et Fides editorial team, which devoted the entire issue from 2-7-2019, 2 February 7th, 2019, to this kind of reflection on transhumanism. Most of the texts present in present interpretations of transhumanism, seeing its roots in its historical philosophical concepts of the Frankfurt School. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. The Frankfurt School. Do you know what the Frankfurt School is? It's the precursor organization of Tavistock. Frankfurt School is the father of Tavistock. And this is where transhumanism had its roots, the modern notion of it. Of course, this could be traced all the way back as far as we can go through the ancient mystery schools and through all the occult fraternities going all the way back. But the modern inception of it comes directly from the Frankfurt School and then later through Tavistock and the various other satellite networks that these social controllers use to convey ideas, especially academia, places like Oxford. Let's continue reading here. They present the concepts as a critique which relies on Adorno and Horkheimer's interpretation of the Enlightenment. They also collate them with the leading representatives of the contemporary transhumanism, who are the founders of the World Transhumanist Association, currently known as Humanity Plus. On the other hand, however, we can look at the problem of human improvement from the viewpoint of the Thomistic philosophy. Here comes the right perspective. Considering the ideas of transhumanism from the viewpoint of man's nature, his limitations, but also his incredible ability to transcend limitations, one of the authors, Mariano Asla, states, quote, Aquinas's peculiar metaphysics, together with its anthropology, in which the natural, the supernatural, and the preternatural realms intertwine, can offer an interesting framework to assess the human enhancement project, end quote. However, a comprehensive glance at the problem of transhumanism is only possible if we can properly understand the main idea of transhumanism, and that would be mind uploading. This technological procedure is to be the culmination of efforts to construct the new man, the figure of a transhuman being is to be a transition state between the contemporary mortal, imperfect man, and the immortality offered to the human mind in an endless cyberspace structure. Gonna pause for a moment there, folks. 
the immortality of an endless cyberspace structure. That sounds really tempting, doesn't it? <laughs> Not. Anyway, let's continue reading here. This concept has so far been considered only in terms of science fiction, but for the last few years, the progress in the field of technology seems to be getting closer to it. And although the mere fact that it is not yet possible to make use of such technology, the path that is supposed to lead people to this possibility in itself can affect very dangerous changes in society. We are already observing more, some symptoms of these changes today, and even though we do not always interpret them in the same way as transhumanists, we should be aware of their consequences. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Now, that's a true statement for sure. This ideology certainly does, in and of itself, lead to per very dangerous changes in our society. And we're seeing them, aren't we? Look around we are seeing these changes. What do you think this whole LGBTQ plus whatever, how many other, other letters they want to add to that thing? What do you think that's all about? It's a dangerous transforming of society. Essentially, it's, it's a method of, how could we say this politely? It's a type of eugenics, in a sense, because it's a depopulation program, but it's a type of eugenics in which you willfully, of your own free will, sign up for it. It's a soft eugenics of sorts. You get people to be enticed into these ideas and question the very nature of their reality and who they are, confuse them, introduce confusion, and give them opportunities to double down on that confusion over and over again ad nauseum. And then make it unacceptable for people to either reject that notion or question that notion and push it in the face of the culture 24-7. It is Pride Month, after all. Pride. What does the Bible say about pride? Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The delicious irony of that statement, right? But uh, here we are, and people forget that. And they celebrate pride. One of the seven deadly sins, pride. Pride leads to hubris, arrogance. Anyway, don't want to take that too far out of context, but the whole point here is we're seeing this unnatural notion being promoted and promulgated in our society and our culture a synthetic type of a thing it's not a grassroots thing going on certainly not it's been hijacked and used as an agenda piece that's what's been done with that so not a natural thing going on and of course unnatural the inversion of natural order that's what these people are all about. That's what the ultimate goal of transhumanism is. It's the complete inversion of natural order because, you see, these people that promote this transhumanist ideology, they find natural processes repugnant, the natural world repugnant. They want to build something completely artificial, completely in opposition to this natural order that exists that's what this is about. And that brings us to the next portion of the paper here, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence should be traced as a technology use, using the two pillars of the transhumanist NBIC, information technology and cognitive science. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So the artificial intelligence should be using these two pillars. Interesting choice of words in this very sciencey paper, isn't it? The pillars, two pillars, always two pillars, just like masonry. Anyway, let's go ahead and continue. So he identifies these pillars as information technology and cognitive science. 
Scientists representing the modern scientific paradigm first noticed a number of dangers associated with the very dynamic development of artificial intelligence technology. Max Tegmark and his collaborators organized an important international artificial intelligence safety conference in Puerto Rico in 2015 to address this issue. The consequence of this activity was also the establishment of scientific research institutes, such as the Future of Life Institute, which not only organize annual conferences, but also conduct interdisciplinary research and identify threats resulting from the technological advancements. During the Asilomar Conference in 2017, a team of scientists identified precisely the risks associated with the uncontrolled development of AI technology and established, attempted to establish a code of ethical conduct to prevent its adverse effects. The document that was produced during the conference was called the Asilomar Declaration and is a set of 23 detailed rules. The document has so far been signed by 1,583 scientists specializing in research on AI technologies and robotics and 3,447 scientists representing other fields of knowledge. It is extremely important that scientists working at universities all over the world and scientists employed in high-tech corporations have noticed the problem. Indeed, it depends on them how such technologies will develop further, and whether the uncontrolled development of certain AI algorithms will be managed in such a way that they serve the social benefit and do not further increase the area of dangerous and unfair applications. The general assumption of Asilomar AI principles points out that the artificial intelligence technologies are now widely used by all people in the world. However, to ensure its further harmonious development, it is necessary, IA, to uh, provide funding for the beneficial use of AI in critical non-technical sciences such as economics, law, ethics, and social sciences. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Did you know ethics is a science now? <laughs> ethics. It's a science. Of course it is. Because, well, we'll get to that in the future. I'm working on something right now talking about that whole notion about ethics, where it's going and what it's about, and how it's been weaponized now by these very same people. We'll get to that at some other point. But uh, let's continue. I uh, just wanted to point that out here just as a little side note. But let's continue. The authors of the Declaration wonder what should be done to make AI systems do what humans want them to do, and at the same time, be safe and resistant to damage and external intrusion. In addition, the scientists wonder how to update the legal systems so that they are adapted to the implementation of AI systems and who should be given priority in cases of conflict, man or machine. Discussions on the Declaration are currently taking place in the scientific community among representatives of different fields of knowledge. It can, of course, only be regarded as a wish list as there is little practical way to enforce it. But that does not seem to me the major weakness of this document. The document creators seem to believe that they will be able to implement a utopian project to derive the basic ethical principles from scratch and implement them using only logical principles in the advanced AI algorithms. They consider the issues of the mutual coexistence of man and AI without the subject, actually. Man is treated by them, as well as by the transhumanists, as an unfinished, flawed, and limited product of biological evolution. If they see any metaphysical aspects, it is only in the unexplained gaps in human knowledge that they believe will be filled with inevitable technical and scientific progression. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So yes, all of these mysteries of the universe that mankind has been pondering 
since his inception and creation here by God, our creator, the one who made all things and imbued us with the spark of life, man, according to the transhumanists, will one day understand this. Once he's merged with the machine, the artificial intelligence will make it all perfectly clear to us. We'll be all-knowing, just like God's. Do you hear the hubris in a lot of this? Do you see the flawed thinking in it? So, once we merge with the machine, well, it's only a matter of time before we, through this union between man and machine, will unlock all the mysteries of the universe, will understand everything in some scientific material world type way. Do you see where they kind of miss the point on a lot of things, where they try to eliminate the spiritual aspect out of everything, and they think that they could get away with this? They, they think that this is all there is, this material world. In essence, a, a lot of these transhumanists, and these people that would seek this type of a thing, they, they would want to lock themselves in this material world, if they could not have to face up to any spiritual truths. That's what a lot of this is about. A lot of it's about some of these people, they fear death because they fear the notion that at some point they may be answerable to some higher source, some higher power. They don't want that. Many of these dark occultists at the top of the power structure in this world certainly don't want that. They don't want to be held accountable for the things that they've done. They don't want to have to think about that. It makes them uncomfortable. They know they've done some selfish, bad things. Of course, they have a different standard of ethics and morals than the rest of us, as we'll see as we get for further through this. In fact, like they, I've said, they relegated it now to a science. You see, it's, it's not something that's inherently a natural law or any such thing. Now it's a science. So as a science, it's quantified properly and can be, can be manipulated in that way. You see, if they've quantified it in this way, turned it into a definitive thing, by defining a thing, you garner some control over it. By quantifying a thing in this way, you garner some control over it. Now, they're very vague about what their description of actual ethics or morals really are. What's the standard to which they're, they're measuring it? Well, it's moral relativism. There's no absolute standard of right or wrong to these people, to those in the hyper-materialist paradigm. It's all very fluid. So that being the case, if there's no absolute standard of right or wrong, well, then that makes for a very tricky situation, doesn't it? It gives them a lot of wiggle room for what they define as being ethical, doesn't it? Let's go ahead and continue reading, though. The AI algorithms are already entering directly into the medical diagnostic processes. It is no longer man-doctor that is the leading component of the diagnostic process. The physician begins to play only the role of coordinator and possibly the last instance before making a decision in the process of applying medical technologies. An advertisement for the deep learning algorithm implemented by IBM as a commercial product called Watson may be symptomatic in this respect. As a system supporting the efforts of doctors, it is advertised with the slogan, quote, I can read 5,000 new medical studies a day and still see patients. What about you? End quote. So man has to acknowledge the superiority of the machine because it can analyze more data and make a diagnosis much faster. So it seems that the natural progression in the further development of technology will simply be to connect the human doctor directly to the Watson system. But the machine will learn from man very quickly and take over their competences, and the role of man will be gradually reduced. Is this the future of medicine we want? The problem of human replacement by a machine is important if we look at it through the prism of the planned use of mind uploading. 
going to pause for a moment here, folks. So this is where the rubber meets the road with a lot of this. You see, these technologies, as useful as they are and as helpful as they can be, they still lack that human intuition, that human imagination, and that human connection. So what's their solution to this? Well, let's upload the mind and merge it with the machine, and that doesn't become a problem anymore. You see, because it will become human, and the human will become machine, and they'll be integrated, one in the same being, and therefore problem solved, right? At least that's the notion here. So let's read on, because the next portion talks directly about mind uploading. Copying the human mind is a process that is not yet technically feasible. However, using the methodology of scientific reductionism, the proponents of transhumanistic ideology believe that if we already know how to imitate many human mental activities using computer technologies, then in the next few years we will develop technical possibilities to combine these methods and transfer them to a copy of the human brain created in digital topological logical spaces. A representative of transhumanism, a precursor of the practical implementation of mind transfer, Keith Wiley, is already considering the practical problem of two copies of the mind coexisting simultaneously, and he says here, quote, the biggest philosophical conclusion derives via carefully examining the implications of patternism for various mind-uploading scenarios, is that following a split of one mind into two, both are fairly considered continuations of the original. It does not have to be either or. If you are copied into a robot, the biological you and the copy should both be considered value conti or valid continuations of you. End quote. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So, <laughs> what this is saying is they're both you. <laughs> so, the real you and the artificial knockoff of you are both considered the real you. That, that's what this guy says. Um, I, I would ask, what, what spirit? Where, where's the spirit? Where's the animus in the machine? In the robot copy? And it is a copy. This gets to... Some more philosophical questions when you get down to the heart of it. If you have a chance, I would highly recommend on my actual YouTube channel. It's still there. I put it up there, posted it many, many years ago now. There's a TED Talk on there from a guy named Robin Hansen. Go back and listen to that. He talks about this whole notion of creating emulates, as he calls them, the term he used, of people within the computer and that they'll develop their own culture and society. And this has a direct type of a tie to the transhumanist notion of things. Listen to what that guy says. He's an economist. And that should tell you something right there. Uh, an economist. Because economists are social engineers, folks. That's what they do. If you've ever wondered what an economist does, it's not about sitting in crunching numbers and figuring out financial obligations and banking practices and that things, that type of thing. That's part of it. But economists are social engineers. So when you understand that, that our money system is an alchemical system of sorts that's used for control, it's been quantified how it is. Money is a quantification of human energy. That's what it is. It's a measure of social energy. And being a measure of social energy, a precise measure of social energy, it can be used to manipulate people, as we see. And that's the case here. So that's what economists do. They're social engineers. They make certain dictums that people wind up following, but... Uh, this guy was kind of keyed in on a few things, and he sounds kind of like a weasel, and he's a little, uh, you know, nervous and stuff in his talk, but he has had his finger on the pulse of this stuff, and this was years ago. But check that video out. That's on my, my YouTube channel. It's still there if you get a chance. But at any rate, let's continue reading here. Such a position is not fully justified, even as part of 
discoveries of neurosciences. The recreation of mental states that arise in the space of mind, which are described by a nonlinear dynamic theory, is not possible due to the chaotic nature of these processes. The states in the space of mind are described by nonlinear attractor structures, which are unique and characteristic only for strictly defined initial conditions prevailing in natural neural structures. As a result of exact copying, we get not a copy of the human mind, but a neurodynamic structure that we cannot say much about today. Transhumanists do not seem to notice this problem and conduct increasingly advanced research using the opportunities offered by modern science. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So it seems to me the author of this paper understands the flaw in their thinking. <laughs> so he says it, it creates a neurodynamic structure that we cannot say much about today. It is not a human mind because we can't even fully ad accurate, accurately adequately describe what the human mind really truly is. And they try to equate it to the brain, which has some logic to it in some regards, and has some truth to it in some regards, but mind and brain are two separate things. So there's a distinction to be made, but let's go ahead and continue reading. Perhaps, paradoxically, it is the language of mathematics that, in practice, will help us stop the destructive ideas of transhumanists. Technoscience is sometimes referred to as an application of mathematical expressions that describe the material world. By using the language of mathematics, humanity has made most of its discoveries and inventions, and it is also the main tool of technological process or progress. We often forget that it also has its limitations, as does the natural language we use every day. One of these limitations is the ability to predict states in nonlinear dynamic systems. This is where the determinism of linear mathematical models ends. Neural systems require a form dramatically different from the applied models described in the language of mathematics. Their behavior cannot be calculated even on a small time scale. This is exactly the situation with predicting and at the same time copying and transferring the mental states that arise in the space of the human mind. The argument arising from the properties of nonlinear dynamic systems seems stronger than the Penrose-Lucas argument used so far, which uses Godel's theorem on the incompleteness of formal systems to show that the human mind cannot be explained in purely mechanistic terms going to pause for a moment here, folks. So I see this as absolutely a true criterion here as well. The, the human mind cannot be explained in purely mechanistic terms the way the transhumanists would like it to be, the way the materialists, the hyper-materialists would like it to be. It is not the brain. The mind is not the brain. And the function of the brain is not fully understood either. And this kind of thing cannot adequately be explained by advanced mathematics, although they can make close models, approximate models. And even if they can make a close, approximate, a close approximation of these things, it can offer them some type of quantification and therefore control. So even if it's imprecise, they can still garner some type of control of sorts or manipulation. So that's why they still seek that. But anyway, let's go ahead and continue on here. Godel's theorem does not set out the criterion of truth, but only the criterion of non-contradiction. In turn, the language of mathematics describing states of mind is unambiguous in determining the truthfulness of solutions. We do not know and are unable to determine how the states of mind will change, e.g. in artificial virtual digital spaces. So the construct that will appear in supercomputer structures when technologically the mind uploading becomes possible will certainly not be a copy of the human mind. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So he's hitting on the same points that I was already hitting upon. It's not going to be the ontological self. It's not going to be you. It is not going to be the true human being there. It's just going to be a gross approximation made by a computer algorithm. That's it. 
and a recreation of your behaviors and perhaps some of your thoughts. And that's about it. It's not going to be you. You're not going to become immortal uploading your brain into a machine. That's, that's total... It's a total lie and fabrication, born in the pits of hell. That's what transhumanism is. But people will buy into the notion, because we've been so programmed through science fiction and through various other things, and there's always been this occult notion of being able to transfer your mind into a different body. That's been with us from time immemorial. And is there something to that? Maybe there is, maybe there's not. I can't say for sure. But this idea goes back a lot further than this as well. But at any rate, it's not natural. It goes against the natural order of things. Even if it is possible, it's going to have karmic type consequences to it. So let's go ahead and we'll continue reading on here. Regrettably, we do not know what or who it will be. I also do not think that this problem is a sufficient obstacle to scheduling such experiments. We can also state that another unresolved problem is the relationship of the human body to the human mind. The subjective world of sensations and the objective world of neurodynamic processes have so far not been linked by a coherent scientific theory. The basic question to be asked is, therefore, should we look for such a link at all? Should we not treat man as a whole where mental and material processes combine to form an inseparable system of homeostasis, individual and unique? The scientific method of reductionism has already proved more than once unreliable, especially with regard to nonlinear dynamic systems. Preferably, science should try to discover and describe those phenomena that describe a person as a whole rather than treating a man as a set of separate elements. The transhumanistic vision of mind transfer completely ignores this issue. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. I think perhaps the author here has missed all of the work that's been done on a little scientific discipline known as cybernetics, which studies whole systems control... There are those within the transhumanist workings and scientific groups that have looked at this problem and are considering these things because it's using the cybernetics approach of whole systems control where they look at the big picture, they look at the whole unit rather than all the separate constituent parts. So they have applied this type of thinking to these things but much of what's been discussed about mind transfer on the superficial level does ignore a lot of these possibilities. But I'm sure within the auspices of some of the special access programs and black budget science that goes on, they've thought about this and have worked on ways to apply methodologies to duplicate as much of this stuff as they can to duplicate all of the interaction between all of these complex systems that make up the human body. So, I think he's wrong about that. I think he's misconstruing some things, because the cybernetics principles certainly have been applied to transhumanism. But let's go ahead and continue here. Transhumanists consider the problem of mind transfer only in material terms, treating the mind only as a product of neural activity and therefore completely ignore the concept of the human soul. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So yes, this guy totally understands that application here, that they are missing the point with this, and in fact they are, but they don't care because they want to separate that from their new paradigm. Let's continue. And yet, if we look at this notion in the simplest and most comprehensible way possible, even for atheists determined entirely by the paradigm of technoscience, they will have to give some logical answer. The concept of a dia dialogical soul can be identified in a technological way with a kind of dynamic connection between the personality of man and God. 
It is not, of course, a simple communication channel, an ability, or a tool, but it certainly has to be reflected in the states of mind of the human being. The biblical concept of soul shows us that there is no existence of a soul without a body. Therefore, any aspect of humanity cannot be underestimated and forgotten in scientific work. The soul is associated with the body, and not only with the abstract, immortal part of man, existing autonomously in the space of humanity. From a technical point of view for practical implementation of mind transfer, Research is conducted in two main directions. First, they need to gather as much information as possible about the structure, biological development, and functioning of the human brain. These data will be used to build a digital neuronal matrix on which a copy of the mind will be saved. To this end, various technologies are used to collect accurate information about the work of the human brain to create appropriate simulations based on them. The second direction we can call it biological, involves the use of biotechnology methods to perform experiments on live human neurons. Research in this area is to allow accurate mapping of the biological structures in the digital neural matrix. To achieve proper accuracy, each of these routes uses nanotechnology methods. So here we have all four NBIC pillars of transhumanism. In the following sections, the specific activities in the scientific areas will be very briefly summarized. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So as we see, basically it's all about mapping the brain to these people. They want to completely ignore the idea of soul, spirit, animus, the divine spark, this thing that makes us living beings, gives us consciousness and thought. They want to ignore that and just look at the physical framework. And that's the thing this guy is pointing out. He says they're not considering that stuff. They're missing a part of the picture, and this is problematic. And how are they going to explain this? So the guy writing this paper, he wants a, an explanation from these people why, why it is that they feel they could ignore this. And, of course, they'll have some kind of a notion about this that they'll come up with to explain away any such concerns. They'll find, oh, I don't know, they'll probably claim that they found some fundamental particle that makes people conscious or some such thing that imbues consciousness, much like the God particle. You remember that notion in physics a few years back where they found this this God particle, as they called it, that gives mass to matter, or that's what the claim is, this fundamental quantum particle, the God particle, they called it. They'll, they'll come up with some such a thing for consciousness. I, I, I would almost bet on that. I would almost bet on that. They, they'll try to make it some type of a particle or some type of particle interaction that they'll claim is the core of consciousness. And if they can do that, well, that gives them an excuse for quantification here or a means of convincing people that they've quantified it and are able to control it in that way. So therefore, that would give them justification, in my view, for working in this way. Well, it'll give them... It'll save face for them, let's put it that way, with the bulk of the masses who would buy into this scientific notion. Because don't you know, everything's a fundamental particle to these people. And if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. And that's the whole point. That's why everything's a fundamental particle. If it's a fundamental particle, then it can be weighed and measured and quantified and therefore controlled. That's what it's all about. So they they want to give some type of a measure of control to a thing, so that's probably what they'll do. I could be totally wrong about that, and I do reserve the right to be totally wrong about that, but that would be my guess as into the future here, how they will quote-unquote solve the problem of the soul being a part of, you know, uh, being the problem with uploading someone's mind to a machine. They'll have solved that because they will have made this this discovery, probably through the help of artificial intelligence, too. 
<laughs> but anyway, I don't want to get too far out of line here with what we're talking about. But that that would perfectly, you know, probably frame up their their excuse for how or why it could potentially work and convince people of this when it is in fact a lie. Let's continue on. So information technology. Numerical simulations of the structure of the human brain require powerful computing power. Classic supercomputers are not able to meet very high demands on computing power. According to Ray Kurzweil, simulating the human brain at the level of a single neuron requires zeta flops. Well, the best supercomputer currently has petaflops a million times less. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. Zeta flops. <laughs> so a computer needs zeta flops to simulate one human neuron. Uh, so there you go. So this is the superiority of the human brain to anything that man can build. So uh, let's let's put it that way. So this has been pointed out by Kurzweil. And maybe they do have computers that could produce zeta flops of data here and not just petaflops. But uh, anyway, let's go ahead and continue reading. But today, the situation has changed radically because we already have a practical possibility of quantum calculations. Here we go. Which completely changed the calculation paradigm. In the field of information technology, the majority of the important discoveries take place in closed laboratories of multinational corporations, where it is not customary to publish the results of current research due to the current business model. In today's technology market, profit is the most important action driver. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. That is, of course, unless you're Disney, then it's the message. <laughs> but anyway, let's continue on. Or or Budweiser, for that matter. But uh, let's continue. Um, so where did we leave off? In today's technology market, profit is the most important action driver. Research results are usually made available only after the launch of a new technological product. And anyway... Most new technological information is kept secret. An excellent example of such a behavior was the information announced by Google on the 23rd of October 2019 that it developed a prototype of a quantum computer which it named Sycamore. So it seems that Google has managed to build a quantum computer capable of calculations that are basically unattainable even for the largest modern supercomputers. They managed to overcome the problems related to the long-term maintenance of coherent quantum states for a longer period of time, allowing them to perform practical calculations. Google representatives believe that this is a technological leap forward that will completely transform our civilization. Sycamore is equipped with a processor that uses the superconductivity phenomenon to perform calculations utilizing 53 cubits. Cubits. It practically made calculations that lasted about 200 seconds, and if the same calculations were to be made by Summit, the most powerful supercomputer in the world today, built by IBM, it would take more than 10,000 years. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. And some similar things were said about the D-Wave adiabatic quantum computer that was actually made years before this one built by Google. They learned a lot of stuff with that functions just slightly differently than Google's quantum computer. But essentially what this boils down to is different algorithms. They use different algorithms to come to these answers, the solutions of these problems. And it's all about just the scaling of it. Uh, so at, at that rate, quantum computers are much better at making much faster calculations and actually coming to estimates through the use of these algorithms that they have. And it is an estimate, but it's really a very accurate estimate when they give you these answers and because of the nature of, of the algorithms that were designed for this. It's called uh, optimization. Uh, I can't think of the term for it. Um, it's been a long time since I looked at this, this concept of how the quantum computers allegedly work, but it's, it's some type of optimization is what the algorithm's called. Uh, so at any rate, that that's neither here nor there. But the whole point here is they have computers that could make much more rapid calculations this way. So even though it's approximate, it's still close enough. And that's the whole point here. That's what quantum computers do. They get close enough. 
It's not exact, but it's close enough. So let's continue reading. Although the results of research on the quantum computer have been published in a prestigious scientific journal, the scale of the undertaking is evidenced by the number of authors of the paper, namely as many as 69, or 96, sorry, 96, not 69. Uh, the authors represent mostly commercial institutions, technology companies, although they also work concurrently at universities. No, no conflicts of interest there, right? Uh, let's go ahead and continue. Such a large research team is certainly not a good place to discuss ethical and moral aspects or the far-reaching consequences of the technology being developed. Any studies conducted only at state universities have a more open structure. Researchers share their results, although more and more often the latest technologies are not published in specialist journals, but in conference materials which are the products of meetings of very hermetic groups of specialists. Researchers use a specialist language that is full of advanced terminology of mathematics. Therefore, when discussing the latest publicly available research results, we must be aware that they come from research projects that are usually already completed, and even newer solutions are still hidden in specialist laboratories. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Usually loaded down with jargon loaded down with technical jargon for the particular thing and if you don't know how to navigate the technical jargon you're not sure what you're looking at so even so even if you take the time to learn the technical jargon and read through it oftentimes you'll find that they say a whole lot of nothing in many of these research papers it's all just filler <laughs> it's all very wordy for the sake of being wordy and sounding like they, they're intelligent and they know what they're talking about with a lot of this stuff. When, in fact, most of the time the conclusions are, you know, inconclusive at best in a lot of these things. But uh, at any rate, they do like to put together research papers and stuff like that. Uh, but at any rate, let's continue reading because we're almost finished here. We'll have to wrap it up. Therefore, performing accurate simulations of the human brain with the use of a quantum computer may turn out to be much simpler than the simulation projects conducted so far. Using the classical reductionist paradigm, transhumanists believe that in order to make a copy of the human brain, it is necessary to understand its structure to the level of synaptic connections of individual neurons. The results of neuroscience research clearly indicate that the mental phenomena in the human brain are created on the basis of synergy with the use of nonlinear dynamic processes, while the structure of neuronal connections changes according to numerous neurodynamics couplings. Therefore, a thorough knowledge of the very structure of neural connections is unlikely to allow the reconstruction of the exact mental states described by the neurodynamics. This is still an unexplored area of scientific investigation. However, the studies on accurate mapping of the human brain have been going on for a dozen or so years and have now gained considerable momentum. One of the oldest scientific projects carried out since 2010, which is related to the human brain structures, is the project carried out by a consortium of American universities called the Human Connectome Project. The studies by scientists are focused on recreating the simulations of the cerebral cortex for 15 to 33 billion neurons, each of which can have up to 10,000 synaptic connections. The project has been repeatedly expanded as better and better technological solutions have emerged to analyze larger and larger data sets using big data algorithms. The final result of the research is to specify the structure of the neural matrix of the human brain in order to find effective drugs for neurodegenerative diseases. Of course it is. The project is scheduled to be completed in 2022. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. This paper was written in 2020, and I don't think that this project was completed in 2022. I'll have to check on that, though. The European equivalent of the HCP, or the Human Connectome Project, is the Human Brain Project, launched in 2013, which, however, no longer has utilitarian medical applicability goals, but is clearly intended to focus on building an artificial brain. 
To this end, the scientists perform a large number of brain neuroimaging studies using fMRI technology. They also work on biological materials and analyze the collected data using AI algorithms. The first stage of creating the neural matrix, which will be a true copy of the neural structure of the human brain, is to create an appropriate visualization. It is supposed to represent all possible neural connections by assigning them appropriate parametric weights responsible for the way neural networks are activated. Such a graphical network is called a connectogram and was proposed by scientists from the Laboratory of Neuroimaging in Los Angeles, California in 2012. The method of human connectome examination is also used in the studies of human fetuses. Scientists from the Dutch University of Utrecht examined 105 pregnant women using the fMRI method and reconstructed the fetus brain connectome at different fetal stages. The results of the research indicate that the most important functional features of the connectome are formed in the second and third trimester of pregnancy. According to the paper's authors, quote, Understanding the organizational principles of fetal connectome organization may bring opportunities to develop markers for early detection of alterations of brain function, end quote. Thus, we see that the use of the latest diagnostic and analytic technologies allows us to examine even the functioning of the human brain in the fetal period. In order to implement practical devices connecting the human brain with AI systems, it is necessary to thoroughly examine the structures of the human brain, and it must be done during its natural activity. Invasive research on the human brain is prohibited by law in most countries, which is why scientists from the Technical University of Lausanne initiated a project to study the brain of other mammals, starting their research with a thorough examination of the mouse brain. The project is called Blue Brain Project and is designed to create a virtual brain simulation using reverse engineering technology a method already successfully used in AI algorithms. In 2019, Idan Segev, one of the computational neuroscientists working on the Blue Brain Project, gave a talk titled Brain in the Computer, What Did I Learn from Simulating the Brain? In his talk, he mentioned that the whole cortex for the mouse brain was complete and virtual EEG experiments would begin soon. He also mentioned that the model had become too heavy on the supercomputers they were using at the time, and that they were consequently exploring methods in which every neuron could be represented as a neural network. Unfortunately, the scientist working on the project is not considering the ethical problem of constructing a working simulation of a mouse brain. He is only interested in the usable aspect and the problem of the possibility of extending the same methods to the brains of larger mammals. The scientists working at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology have developed a prototype implant implanted directly into the brain, emulating various functions with direct control via smartphone. This implant is designed to administer drugs and measure the neuronal activity of the cerebral cortex under the influence of their use. The assumption is that this is to be a smartphone-controlled implant that allows the measurement of neuronal activity with the possibility of direct biochemical activation from outside. The experiment with the prototype was carried out on mice and ended up achieving all initial assumptions. Therefore, the way to implant the technologies used in cell phones directly into the human brain only depends on obtaining permission for such experiments. The new BCI technology thus gains another important technological opportunity. And I think we're going to finish it up right there, folks. The cell phone. The cell phone is an important step forward for BCI devices. You see... There's a reason these things are in everybody's pocket. And it all has to do with this notion of moving towards transhumanism. BCI devices, you'll find many of these that are being developed are controlled via smartphone, just like all your smart appliances in your home and everything else. Control it through an app. Same thing. I mean, they're going to make it so the human mind can be manipulated through a phone app. And I would largely say people are already largely manipulated by their cell phones. 
in many ways, and it doesn't even require an implant of a BCI device, at least an acknowledged one of sorts. And that's the danger that we get into with this type of technology. It could be very invasive. The whole point here is the transhumanists, they totally disregard concepts like the spirit or soul. And they see everything as a manifestation of some material, physical world, cause and effect scenario. Therefore, consciousness and these things, they have no concerns about that. They feel they can quantify this at some point and understand it exactly. And probably sometime in the near future with the help of artificial intelligence. That's what their hope is. That's what they're working towards. And that's what they plan to build. But we can reject that. And I think we need to reject that because we know it's just not going to work. There's more to a human being than just this physical world this material world. There's more to what it is to be fully human than that. And therefore, they're missing a part of the formula here in this transhumanist notion of things. But they're in panic mode because they know their time's running short and they want to try to implement this. And perhaps at the topmost levels of the power structure, they know it's doomed to failure. But yet they still see it as their only chance of getting the things that they want. Achieving some type of immortality. Being the gods of this place. Avoiding, avoiding answering to a higher power by trapping themselves here in this materialist paradigm. And like Rudolf Steiner described it, this is the spirit of Ahriman at play here. And like I said, it's the spirit of Antichrist, trapping people in this physical paradigm. No hope of spiritual elevation or reunification with God. No hope of that. And they see this as being a better notion for them. But is it a better notion for all of humanity? Well, no, I would say it's not. I would say it's certainly not. Now, there are some very positive things that can be garnered from these technologies that we're developing. But I think it's a total mistake to go all the way here with it to the point of trying to upload the human mind to a machine. It's not going to work. It, the notion is fundamentally flawed because it overlooks the metaphysical side of things. It overlooks the spiritual side of things. It overlooks the very things that make us human and give us this divine spark of life. These very things are overlooked by this. So do we want to essentially bring about the destruction of humanity and maybe the rise of the machines, as so many of the movies have warned us about? Because even the notion of merging with the machine to avoid that fate leads directly to that fate anyway. We can see transhumanism is a flawed ideology in many ways. But many people see a whole lot of hope attached to it. And this is where it becomes a dangerous idea. And this is where it, it sucks a lot of people in with its promises. Its promises that it can't deliver upon. And it won't deliver upon. And this is where the concern lies. So... Uploading the human mind to a machine, is it possible? Well, those in the scientific worldview here, this scientific paradigm we live in, this materialist paradigm, would like you to believe that it's possible. But is it really possible? Or will you lose your soul if you attempt to do that? Or will you just simply cease to be living? That's, that's the whole point. It's, it's a destructive type of a thing here. It's about the destruction of humanity. It's actually a population reduction strategy. I don't think those dark occultists at the top of the power structures really believe that human beings will be able to transfer their, their, their very essence into a machine. I think they know that's not feasible. 
but they push it anyway because, well, there's a, a long, long delineation of depopulation campaigns that have been circulated through the years here. We see that. And a lot of it's about control with these people. So who's to say? What's the true nature of all of this? I think only time will tell, but we need to be weary of it. Anyway, folks, I hope you enjoyed this reading tonight. I appreciate each and every one of you. I want to thank you all for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Have a good night now. Come with me.